Since the October 7th massacre by Hamas and Israel's brutal response, the Middle East once again entered a period of violence and unpredictability. Israel is currently fighting a war on several fronts – in Gaza against Hamas, in Lebanon against Hezbollah, against the Houthis in Yemen, and most importantly against Iran. All of these fronts are interconnected, and in this video we are going to describe the recent developments and how things may escalate further. This video is sponsored by our YouTube members and patrons, who get two exclusive videos weekly, not available anywhere else, for their kind support of our channel. You can join their ranks to watch more than 160 videos, including our series on the Pacific War, Punic Wars, Persian Wars, Spanish War of Succession, Russo-Japanese War, North African Campaign of World War II, History of Prussia, Italian Unification Wars, Risorgimento, Albigensian Crusades, and much more. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to get the exclusive videos, early access to all public videos, our schedule, wallpapers, access to a special Discord server where we're very active, and much more. Thanks for supporting us, we couldn't be doing it without your help. The current round of hot conflict in the Middle East started with the war between Israel and Hamas, so let's look briefly at the situation in Gaza. After a year of almost uninterrupted bombardment, along with ground operations in North Gaza, then Khan Yunis, and most recently in the Rafa region, Israel now feels in control. It has withdrawn most of its troops, while maintaining a presence in strategic areas such as the Philadelphia Corridor and High Grounds. In his September interview, Israel's Defense Minister Gallant claimed that Hamas as a military formation no longer exists. The IDF conducts occasional raids on different parts of the Gaza Strip to prevent Hamas from regrouping, along with continuing airstrikes. Most recently, in early October, they launched another operation in Khan Yunis. However, Gallant also admitted that Hamas was still capable of conducting guerrilla warfare. They are still targeting the remaining IDF soldiers and vehicles in Gaza. The extent to which Israel has been able to weaken Hamas is up for debate. In May, the Israeli government claimed that they had killed 14,000 fighters since October 7th. Prior to the war, it was estimated that Hamas had some 40,000 fighters. Every party to the war tends to exaggerate the enemy casualties, and one can easily argue that Israel is doing exactly that. However, it is beyond reasonable doubt that the heavy bombardment campaign that has turned many Gazan cities and villages into rubble, and the simultaneous ground invasion has inflicted heavy casualties on the military infrastructure of Hamas. Many Hamas commanders have been killed in this war, and Israel has even claimed the killing of the commander of the organization's military wing, the elusive Mohammed Daif. Hamas has strongly denied this claim. In May, Israel also admitted killing 16,000 civilians in Gaza. Overall, the Hamas-run Gazan authorities have put the total number of casualties above 41,000 without distinguishing between combatants and civilians. But even if the low estimate of civilian deaths suggested by Israel is true, it just shows the level of destruction and devastation brought upon Gaza by the Israeli offensive. Without a shadow of a doubt, Hamas has been significantly weakened, but the destruction of Gaza is causing even more anger and resentment among the ordinary Palestinians towards Israel. Many men of fighting age who have lost their loved ones in this war will undoubtedly express their anger by joining Hamas and other anti-Israel groups. So while a significant number of Hamas fighters have been killed, the existing situation in Gaza creates a fruitful situation for further recruitment. Even in its current battered state, Hamas is capable of hurting the IDF. In June, they made a small incursion into Israel, near Karem Shalom. Throughout summer and autumn, they continued conducting hit-and-run attacks, targeting the IDF's manpower and armored vehicles. Is there a ceasefire in Gaza on the horizon? In early September, the US Secretary of State Blinken stated that the ceasefire deal in Gaza has been 90% agreed. Egypt and Qatar have designed this ceasefire deal while the United States has been pushing Israel to accept it as well. The idea is to achieve a lasting truce by implementing several measures in three stages. In the first stage, Hamas would release 33 Israeli hostages in exchange for 30 Palestinian prisoners kept by Israel. Then Israel would allow a significant amount of humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip, while gradually withdrawing from the areas it still occupies there, allowing the displaced and unarmed Palestinians to return to their homes. After building some degree of trust, the second phase of the deal would be implemented. It entails Hamas releasing all of the remaining hostages who are still alive in exchange for the agreed-upon number of Palestinian prisoners. Israel would also withdraw its remaining soldiers from Gaza. 
The third phase envisages the exchange of remains of deceased Israeli hostages and deceased Palestinian prisoners, along with the end of the blockade of the Gaza Strip by Israel. At the same time, Hamas agrees not to rebuild its military. Hamas has already accepted the deal, but following Blinken's aforementioned statement, Netanyahu said that the agreement is not close. Several Western media outlets have published reports about Israel's unwillingness to accept a deal and making last-minute demands. Israel wants to eradicate Hamas before agreeing to any long-term deal, but how exactly they're going to do that is not yet clear. After all, they have been conducting a very intense air and ground campaign for a year, and if that has not destroyed Hamas fully, then we're talking about an indefinite occupation of the Gaza Strip, which does not guarantee the destruction of anti-Israeli groups in Gaza. It is just going to add to the unimaginable suffering of the people of Gaza, along with further casualties for the IDF. This uncertainty is causing tensions inside Israel too. There have been protests demanding action to return the hostages. Many hostages have already died in captivity. For instance, in August, the IDF claimed that six hostages were killed by Hamas when the Israeli army reached a tunnel where they were held captive. Some others have been killed in the Israeli airstrikes. There is friction inside the Netanyahu government regarding the deal, as the most right-wing members of the cabinet, like Ben Gvir and Smotrich, radically oppose any agreement with Hamas, while the defense minister Gallant is in favor of the ceasefire deal. It is reported that Netanyahu has most recently demanded the continuation of control over the Philadelphia Corridor as part of the deal, while Gallant thinks that is unnecessary, since the IDF can always occupy it once again. Israel has also been fighting with Hezbollah in Lebanon since October 7th. For months, the sides have conducted low-intensity warfare along the Israeli-Lebanese border. The constant artillery and mortar shelling, airstrikes, drone attacks and small skirmishes have not been consequential in terms of altering the military balance between the sides, but it has caused human suffering. Thousands of civilians have been displaced from the border areas due to these hostilities. Hezbollah has been adamant about continuing to cause problems for Israel in the north, while the war in Gaza still goes on, while Israel has been keen to create conditions for the return of their population to the Hezbollah-targeted areas as soon as possible. On September 16th, the Israeli government officially stated that the return of the residents of the north to their homes became one of their war goals. On the following day, we saw one of the most ingenious intelligence operations in history. Pages of thousands of Hezbollah members exploded, killing at least 12 people and wounding thousands. On September 18th, the same thing happened to Hezbollah walkie-talkies and other electronic appliances, according to various social media posts and media reports. The same reports claim that many middle-level Hezbollah operatives and commanders were killed and injured in this attack. Apparently, the Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad, managed to sell pages and walkie-talkies equipped with large batteries, which concealed small explosives to Hezbollah through a third party years ago. These explosives were activated via text messages or remotely. And this was not even the most shocking news for Hezbollah in September. Following the pager attacks, Israel continued telegraphing its intention to dismantle Hezbollah while picking up the pace of airstrikes in Lebanon. The most devastating one for Hezbollah was launched on September 27th, when several residential buildings in Beirut were targeted. This strike killed the longtime leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, along with several other leaders of the organization and a general of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. These attacks were a significant blow to the political leadership of Hezbollah, along with its military command and control structure. However, one should not forget that in terms of its military organization, Hezbollah is fairly decentralized, which means that in theory, they were prepared to withstand this sort of damaging operation to some extent. To what extent this can actually happen will become clear very soon. In any case, these attacks set the stage for another ground offensive by Israel on Lebanon. On October 1st, the IDF started its ground assault. It is still too early in this ground assault to make any definitive conclusions, but the war so far has resembled the 2006 war. Most of the fighting has been going on along the border. There have been reports of battles in and around Odaisa, Kfarkela, Aitash Shab, Misel Jabal and Marun El Ras. We have not seen any news of the confirmed occupation of major towns and cities in South Lebanon yet, as Hezbollah continues to actively resist the IDF. For instance, on October 2nd, they ambushed and killed at least six soldiers of the elite Egos Commando unit of the Israeli army. Another similarity is the relatively small force deployed by the IDF in the ground assault so far. We have seen reports of special units like Egos in action, 
along with elements of the 36th Division, including the Golani Brigade. Whether that will be enough to achieve the presumed goal of pushing Hezbollah north of the Lotani River is not clear. It did not in 2006. The IDF ground assault is also supported by regular airstrikes in South Lebanon, in and around Beirut, and on the border with Syria. Again, just like in the 2006 war, the Israeli airstrikes have not been able to stop Hezbollah from launching rocket attacks on North Israel. However, the start of the ground assault on Lebanon has not been the most important news from the Middle East. The recent escalation between Israel and Iran, which has rather destructive potential, is the most important story in the world these days. To understand what is happening, we have to go back a bit. In April 2024, Israel bombed the Iranian embassy in Damascus. One of the casualties of this attack was Mohammad Reza Zahedi, one of the commanders of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Iran retaliated two weeks later. According to the Israeli military, Iran launched 170 Shahed drones, 30 cruise missiles, and 120 ballistic missiles. Simultaneously, Iran supported groups, including Hezbollah and the Yemeni Houthis, launched rockets and drones on Israel. The Israeli air defenses, with the support of the United States, Britain, and Jordan, shot down most of the drones and missiles, missing only a few, which did minor damage to the Nevatim and Ramon air bases. Israel responded with a minor attack on the military infrastructure in the Isfahan region, but for a while, the sides chose not to attack each other directly. But following the Hezbollah rocket strike on the football stadium in the Golani Heights in July, which killed 12 people, Israel retaliated in force. On July 31st, a senior Hezbollah commander, Fuad Sukkur, along with several civilians, were killed in the Israeli airstrike on Beirut. The then Hamas leader, Ismail Haniyeh, who was in exile in Iran at the time, was killed in an Israeli strike on Tehran on the same day. Iran vowed to retaliate once again. However, they did that only after its coalition suffered painful blows from the Mossad pager operation, the increased bombing of Lebanon, and finally the killing of Nasrullah and another Islamic Revolutionary Corps general in the same strike. But when they did, they did that at a massive scale. On October 1st, Iran launched arguably the biggest attack using ballistic missiles in history, in terms of the number of missiles used. Israel reported more than 180 missiles being launched by Iran, while the Iranian state TV claimed 200 missiles used in this attack. The exact number of Iranian missiles making an impact is impossible to quantify, due to the operational security on both sides. But the footage on social media showed dozens of Iranian Fatah 1 and Khaybar Shikan missiles managing to bypass the Israeli air defenses. It seems like the main target of this attack was the Nevatim Air Base, which is believed to house F-35 fighter jets. Based on the satellite images of the air base after the attack, the OSINT analysts have estimated 20 to 32 missiles directly hit it. But even though the Iranian media and pro-Iranian social media accounts claimed the destruction of 20 F-35s at the Nevatim Air Base, no evidence to back that up has been presented so far. Since the Iranian attack was expected, and since Iran had actually warned the United States and other countries with close ties to Israel, it is logical to assume that Israel had removed their fighter jets from their usual bases. The Tel Nof Air Base, suspected of housing Israel's nuclear bombs, was another target. Again, several ballistic missiles hit the airbase with at least one impact, causing a secondary explosion. But even if this airbase indeed hosts Israeli nuclear weapons, they are probably placed in very deep bunkers, protected from such attacks. Another notable target was apparently the Mossad headquarters in Tel Aviv, but all the missiles targeted at the building missed it. Unlike in April, this time the Israeli air defenses missed a lot of targets. Whether due to a very high number of more advanced ballistic missiles used, or due to the depletion of Israel's air defense missiles. According to different reports, including the testimony of the American Air Force General Kenneth McKenzie to Congress, made in 2023, Iran has over 3,000 ballistic missiles. This means that Iran can make several more mass launches like this. Their missiles may be imprecise, but the sheer numbers can cause major destruction in Israel, particularly if the Israeli air defense does not do better in potential future attacks. Missiles and rockets in Hezbollah and the Houthi arsenal exacerbate this threat, since Iran can coordinate strikes to make the impact more powerful. Israel has already promised to respond. Several options are on the table, ranging from the Iranian air defense systems, ballistic missile depots and launches, to the country's nuclear or oil infrastructure. The United States has already called on Israel to make sure its retaliation is proportionate. 
It is reported that the Biden administration is against the targeting of Iran's nuclear infrastructure due to the fears of escalation and uncertainty this attack will cause. An attack of such a magnitude will definitely prompt Iran to retaliate even stronger than it did on October 1st. But Israel has long vowed to destroy Iran's nuclear program, and they may consider the Iranian attack as the perfect casus belli to finally conduct this attack. The United States also opposes an attack on Iran's oil infrastructure. It would skyrocket oil prices, which the United States and Europe desperately want to avoid due to the war in Ukraine and for domestic reasons. As of October 8th, Israel has not responded to Iran's missile attack yet. So tensions are clearly rising. Iran has demonstrated its ability to hurt Israel, which is going to retaliate strongly without a doubt. The tit-for-tat attacks by both sides may lead the Middle East to very unpredictable places. All this is happening while Israel and Hezbollah are fighting a full-scale war in Lebanon, and Gaza lies in ruins. The worst thing is that the violence often leads to more violence, without any clear, sustainable way out of this conflict in sight. We will talk about this topic more in the coming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content, Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.